This podcast is brought to you by Clear Cut Window Tinting. With 20 years of experience in the application of lifetime warranty films and over 3,000 happy customers served over the past few years, ClearCut is ready to serve those of you in and around the Denver metro area and are proud to announce the second location grand opening in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Call 720-548-TINT to book your appointment. That's 720-548-8468 and 720-999-5785 for our Colorado Springs location. The professional application of quality film will significantly reduce the heat in your vehicle, reduce glare, and protect your skin and eyes from harmful UV rays. 720-548-TINT or 720-999-5785. Welcome to the Married to Myself podcast. You're listening to the sixth episode. Are you married to an introvert or an... Doesn't even matter because I'm an ambivert. Now what? How does that work out for your relationship? <laughs> oh, Go ahead, Jason. Finish your announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event in this corner Weighing in at none of your business pounds, undefeated in 303 fights, current world lightweight champion, the author, mother, grandma, and not your average wifey of 20 plus years, Danny Collins. And in this corner, weighing in at a rock solid dad bod pounds before drying after a shower, the contender, Jonathan loves to argue with his wife, Collins. Fighters, ready? Fight. Thank you for joining us. This is the Married to Myself podcast. I'm here with my hubby. How's it going? <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about chapter nine, which is seventh grade, mean kids and bullying. You have anything to say before I read what I want to read? I feel like this chapter is about me. (laughs) But I want to say in school, I was the opposite of a bully. Um, I I fought and stood up for the kids that were being bullied. So, yeah. So you got in a lot of fights. And by the time we met, you had how many assault tickets? Uh, Sixteen. But you didn't start any of those fights. Not one. You just finished all of them. Uh, I got caught. Mm-hmm. Got caught fighting? Fighting. But you didn't start any of them. I didn't start any of them. So I used to say I just finished all of the fights. And then I was listening to someone else speak. And they say usually the person that gets in trouble is the one that gets caught. So I got caught. Hmm. You know, the person that hit me... Or, you know, pulled my hair or kicked me. They didn't get caught. But I got caught when I punched them in their face. Yeah. So, so I got caught. Yep. And I wonder if that means that we're not supposed to respond to the person pulling the hair or doing something that's not actually threatening you where you don't have to defend yourself. Are we supposed to walk away from that or hey. run and tell a teacher? That sounds so corny, especially in real life. And I've been in some real life situations where I'm trapped in a bathroom stall girl wants to fight me. I've never fought a day in my life. I'm just being bullied. You run to tell the teacher and that doesn't stop the bullying. It doesn't. <laughs> and that's why you just beat them all up. <laughs> I think it's funny. So after uh, 80 classes of anger management, I was taught that it's not about your response. It's about your reaction. So you don't want to react. To someone you want to respond. So kind of going on what you just said about your response. Um, your response is just fine as long as it's, you know, smart and thought out and patient. But usually reactions are, are what get you in trouble. And that right there is such a huge theme of the book. 
reaction versus response. If you react to your spouse, you're more likely to quote unquote get in trouble, get into some trouble, cause trouble for your relationship. You're involving your emotions. You're going to be emotional. You're going to drain yourself versus taking some time to think out something strategic in how do I address this issue? Because if I react the way that I maybe first think to react, there might be some harsh consequences. Now we're into a, an argument, a fight. We're not talking for a while. It's just adding to the things that we're struggling with in our relationship. So responding versus reaction is huge. For those of you that are new to the podcast, you're not sure what we're talking about. The book is called Growing into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College. The concept is by the end of kindergarten, you would hope that your child would come home from school knowing their colors, shapes, and patterns. At the end of what I would refer to as the kindergarten year or the kindergarten stage of your marriage, you would hope that you now understand colors, shapes, and patterns. Colors I liken unto attitude and emotion, uh, being blue, feeling sad, uh, shapes, meaning the shape, the condition of your life, of your relationship. What shape are you in? What shape have you come out of? And what shape are you working toward? Patterns. What generational things are you walking out in your marriage that are either conducive to you having the life you want to have or destructive and pulling you away from the direction you really want to go, the vision you really have for what you want your marriage to look like. So that's the book that this podcast is based off of growing into a mature marriage from kindergarten to college. So tonight we're talking about seventh grade, mean kids and bullying. I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll talk some more about it. (laughs) Seventh grade, mean kids and bullying. Do you ever feel like you married the seventh grade bully? It's no secret that we marry our opposite in one way or another. And these differing traits can be the very things that keep our relationships exciting, interesting, and great classrooms of learning. Somewhere along the way, usually shortly after the betrothal phase has ended and marriage really begins, the very things that attracted us to each other become the same things we can't seem to stand about each other. My husband was attracted to my innocence which turned into disgust over what post-marriage he perceived as ignorance and immaturity. I was attracted to his loyalty and helpfulness, which after marriage I perceived as an unhealthy attachment to his family and a desire to please everyone. After you allow your perception of what once made you fall in love to something that you view with disdain and disapproval, You become mean and condescending. No one wants to be married to a parental control. But once we decide we know better than the other person, we turn into the classroom bully and create a very hostile environment, not contributing to a healthy learning environment, correcting our spouse's every move and every word as we look over them like a parent over a child, trying to guide and correct them at every turn. It's only a short amount of time after a spouse places themselves in a parental role in their marriage that the confidence of the bullied spouse starts to decline until they both resent each other and no longer have the same attraction to each other that they once treasured. Wow. Um Am I the bully in the book? <laughs> <laughs> You're the only person I've ever been married to. <laughs> no, uh, I think it's funny um, because... Yes, you were a bully. <laughs> you were a big bully for a long time. Yes. Because you thought I was immature and irresponsible it, was that and naive. Um, I think you could have looked at it differently. <laughs> No, you <laughs> were yes. immature and irresponsible. Well, we were both <laughs> immature and irresponsible in our own ways. But right. yes, I was. For sure. Um, it, so, but did I, that give you permission to be mean and rude and bullying? And did that extend the amount of time we had to spend in kindergarten, in the elementary years of our marriage? Because we weren't able to grow faster 
because now I'm resenting you for for both for the bullying or the parenting. I was definitely reacting versus responding. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, it didn't. Uh, it wasn't right what I was doing, but I didn't have an understanding on what I should have been doing. Right. Well, um, so everyone knows, uh, and if you don't, and you're just tuning in. We got married at 16 years old. Um, we were both 16. People always ask us. Um, and so, yes, we were both uh, very immature. Um, and, you know, at some point you have to figure out what role you have to take just in order to get through life. And I decided to take the father role. Um, because I felt like I had a child and versus the, the husband role to a wife. Uh, and that's became like a bully. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge problem for many, for many years. Um, the way I view it is I was going to grow up because we were having the experiences we were having that required me to grow and change because I wanted to grow and change. And I've always seen a really big picture and had very lofty goals for my life. So I knew that change was inevitable and change was something that I wanted. I, it was just maybe more painful than it had to be because of a lack of knowledge in both of us. For sure. For sure. Yep. Um, yeah. So I am thankful that we got married early because a lot of times it doesn't really matter what age you are uh, when you when you come together. You're going to realize the immaturity in one person or another. I mean, doesn't matter if you're 30 or 50. Um, doesn't matter, you know, if, if you've been single and now you're coming together in a relationship. Uh, there's something there's that you're going to be immature about. There's something, you know, I see it happen all the time. People have been living by themselves and they could be 30 years old and instantly they're, oh my God, all my stuff has to get moved or, you know. I have to get rid of some stuff to combine my life with this other person. Yeah. I, it's good. Man, I got to move my stuff. I don't get my Sundays to myself or whatever, you know, it's. It doesn't matter what age you are. You just have to decide to uh, stay in the ring and fight through it and and live and grow. And, you know, it goes back to the last podcast of the no matter what. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go back to some of the stuff that I said so we can um, get into more details for the listeners, because I know this is something that many relationships experience where one person feels they are married to a bully. Um, so one of the first points here, it's no secret that we marry our opposite in one way or another. And these differing traits can be the very things that keep our relationships exciting and interesting, great classrooms of learning. But somewhere along the way, what was exciting and interesting turns into what um, disgusts us about each other. <laughs> so the specific, the specific example for us was you saw me as innocent, um, completely from a different world than what you had grown up in. And that was attractive to you. And then that switched to so immature, so green, doesn't know anything. And then for me, I saw you as, you know, rough around the edges, loyal, you know, the bad boy. And then we get married and I'm like, he is so mean. Hmm. He is a jerk. <laughs> right right yep and i guess you know you can often look and say well what's the difference that you fell in love with you know and people are like no i didn't fall in love with that like well you kind of did mm-hmm. that's that's what you were attracted to and that's what you hung out with you had your rose colored glasses on <laughs> so what was you know a smart ass or a jerk or a really um a uh, sarcastic person looked like um, something different with, with the glasses on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, for sure. And it happens in every relationship. Um, I think, you know, again, you just have to really take your time and, 
and work with the person. And hopefully the, the person is willing to work on themselves in order to not change. I, I, I really don't like when people are like, ah, they want them to change. Because if, if someone completely changed and this is kind of, you know, bunny trail, but we know people that have like bumped their head and, and had a concussion and then their personality changed Mm -hmm. and then they get a divorce, Mm -hmm. you know, because they're not married to the same person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So you, you have to be careful asking for someone to change, uh, be, it's it's just what is it that you want out of them you and know? really knowing what you want yeah because if you change from that aggressive you know what i saw is rough around the edges if those qualities that i might not be able to articulate well enough to to make the audience understand what was so great about those things but if those things which I saw as like the core of who you were, the root of your personality changed, then that would be the real struggle. So we are blinded by now what's irritating and getting on our nerves through, through the, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, the, when you get to know someone really well, um, the, uh, what is the word? Oh my gosh. Formal, not formality. Anyway, I'll, the word will come to me later, but, um, the, <laughs> When you get to know someone really well, the butter- the butterflies go away. Right. Um, and it's easier to become contentious with them because you feel so familiar with them. Right, right. And so once you become familiar, your perspective of what attracted you or was exciting or turned on all the right switches is now hitting the wrong switches because of your perception. And now there's different conversations happening because you've got life and responsibilities and children and real things to discuss that you maybe didn't know to have those conversations in preschool or kindergarten stage of the relationship, you know, going back to other episodes where we talked about setting the boundaries to having the conversation about deal breakers. If you skip those steps, you're liable to end up in in a really rough situation. And we didn't skip those steps and still had a major tug of war for years in figuring out who we were in in our relationship and who we wanted to be. Yeah. I think, I mean, us growing up together, um, you know, meeting at 14, we went through pretty much adolescence together. Mm -hmm. And so it was almost like we became best friends and then it was brother and sister and then we get married and it was like we became uh dad and daughter and then <laughs> so there was there was just so many uh aspects of of the growth into it and you know I, I wish there was a a better way to to explain it out so that people could understand what i see that I, I wish I could have changed in it was um, maybe the the amount of responsibility uh, that I felt um, getting married at 16 years old, having a kid at 17 and just wanting to make sure that that I was there, you know, always being able to pay the bills and take care of the family and try to make the least amount of mistakes as possible. Right. So I don't want to be written off um, for people that are really struggling and going through things in their marriage. And then they're listening to us talk and they're like, oh, well, you were 16. You know, that doesn't compare to anything I'm doing, because after, you know, we've been married 22 years now, after 22 years and probably 2200 couples that we've talked to. The same problems exist for, for people sure. 61 that were existing for us at 16. The same fights, the same responses, the same reactions, like nothing changed. Well, remember that song we are growing up, age ain't nothing but a number. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, so many people, you know, they could tell, well, I'm this old and I've been through this. Like, it doesn't matter. This should be your third marriage. And 
you're going to start back over in kindergarten. You're going to start over. Yeah. You know, you got to Hopefully not. <laughs> but people wear themselves out because <laughs> they think that because they are, you know, grown, whatever age you want to say is quote unquote grown, that things are just supposed to automatically be easier. But if you don't go through the grades, you're going to have to go through the grades. <laughs> and, and really, it doesn't matter who you go through the grades with if you change the person Mm -hmm. and that person also isn't in 11th grade and they're in fifth grade it doesn't matter that you had made it to 11th grade in your previous marriage you start back over starting over you know what you're signing up for you may learn how to respond better versus react so it could be less painful but you still got to start yeah. wherever they're wherever they're at because that's now what you're working with and then that that becomes the teacher student yeah you know and so i'm trying to think i can't off the top of my head like the three main reasons for divorce like the three main struggles so obviously sex is at the top money and the third one maybe is kids i can't remember um but when one parent I'm sorry, when one ah, Freudian slip, <laughs> when one spouse starts acting like a parent because they feel they're pushed into that yep. role that is going to affect your sex, sex life, life yep. because now the other spouse is like, I am not having <laughs> sex with my dad or with my mom, yep. you know, so then the other spouse is frustrated. Well, well, I'm only acting like your parent because you're acting like a child. And it's like, that's still not your place. And, and they st- they go they go hand in hand to me. You know, I, I could say in our relationship, uh, I felt the, the financial part of it is what led to the parenting part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then which led to the... Affecting the, the intimacy. Yeah. yeah was, all three of them it, tied together. It was like, man, so... You really have to, in you know, I can say back then, I was reacting. Mm-hmm. I was reacting wrong. Um, and, you know, if I had a time machine, what would I go back and change? I would definitely go back and uh, uh, change and respond. Um, I would go back and eat the sweet rice if we haven't told you guys that story. <laughs> <laughs> go back and listen to episode two or three. <laughs> Somebody went to jail over some sweet rice. Not enough sugar in the rice. Don't complain about the wife's cooking. <laughs> Man, you know, but, it, you know, if you had the, the opportunities to change some stuff, what would you do? You know, we're, we're talking about bullying um, or being bullied. Uh, and, you know, you think about where you've been a bully in your relationship, um, or where you've, you've been bullied. And- I can think of a place where I had turned into a bully and it was because I was more academic than you and I did better in school, yeah. but you were so way superior to me when it came to social skills in real life. And so once I really caught wind of that, when I would make references to pop culture or things you learn in history and you were always so clueless, I started to feel superior in that. Oh, you're not as smart as I thought you were because you don't know this book stuff. And you're like, well, you're not as smart as I thought you were because you don't know no street stuff. You know, <laughs> right. I pretended to, to be a little street when we met because I thought that would be a requirement requirement for him to like me. And then later I found out, you know, he was just amused by my antics. Um, he told me a few months in, girl, I know you wasn't from the hood. And I'm like, what do you mean? How, how could you tell? He's like, you got braces and you got glasses. That was my first clue. We can't afford none of that. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You know, um, what, what you're attracted to. And I just had this conversation not even a week ago. And I was telling her, I, I was asking a gentleman um, for him to remember what he was attracted to, to a lady he just got married to four years ago. And he was, you know, 50 years old and this was his second wife. And, and he just got married to her four years ago. And now he felt like he was being bullied. And, you know, these I call them just the uh, the shop counseling uh, people walk into our, our shop and they just they start telling us their life story. And, 
you know, he, he was ready to walk out the door. And I said, well, I really want you to think about what you were attracted to four years ago, six years ago when you guys met and, and get back to that place. Yes. And that's the word I was looking for earlier was familiarity. Familiarity. Familiarity breeds contempt. contempt. And in leadership positions, that's important to understand because you never want to cross a certain boundary with the people that you're leading so that they continue to look at you and respect you as their leader and follow you regardless of if they like you or not. You know, a saying that I really respect and appreciate and remind myself all the time is, you know, you're a good leader when people disagree with you or maybe don't like you, but will still follow yep. the vision. That's right. Um, but in a marriage what we want to work hard at is going against the grain of that human nature of allowing the familiarity you now have with your spouse to breed contempt. Yeah. Now you want that familiarity to breed more intimacy, more yes. love, more understanding. Because in the dating phase, you know, maybe preschool, you'd go over to his apartment, to the man cave and pick up his dirty underwear and clean up and do his dishes. And it's cute and it's fun and you enjoy doing it. And he's like, oh, wow, this is so awesome that you're doing this for me and then two three four ten years in and you're like if i gotta pick up another Mm -hmm. sock you know (laughs) we are going to fight and it's like hold on what happened you got familiar (laughs) in a way that is not helping your marriage life is short are you really tripping on the socks you know and the the contempt part of it um, is definitely what happens in so many relationships. That's where cheating comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. You get so familiar with whatever it is, with you know, the, that the, you're seeking the unfamiliarity, yeah. and then you find yourself in an affair because unfamiliarity is what's attractive to yep. you. You know, get your juices flowing, and then you're like, well, I couldn't help you know, but, you know, violate our covenant because there's something over here that I have lost over here in this relationship, but it's a lack of understanding of what's coming down the road from that choice of you acting on your emotions and your hormones, not understanding you can actually bring those hormones back, those exciting feelings back in the relationship you've gone familiar with. Right. And that's, uh, that's, I believe where you become the bully. Mm. Um, because the minute you get familiar, uh, it's almost like you learn how to manipulate yeah. uh, the situation. And, and that's where, you know, so much stuff comes from. That's where cheating comes from. Um, you know, we'll say that's where um, uh, like shopping and stuff comes from. If, if, if you figured out, well, if I piss her off, I get to go buy what I want. Or if I piss him off, I get to, he'll bring me back stuff. You know, it's 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 the same bully game hmm. that you're you're playing. You, you manipulation, yeah, manipulation. You learn how to control, and that's all a bully is. You know, from the beginning, if it, you know, if you're bullying a nerd into doing your homework, uh, you didn't necessarily. Who you calling a nerd? Him. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I never did homework, <laughs> so my wife never had to do mine. <laughs> <laughs> Which we had to. You were going to bully me into yes, doing your homework. Yes. Oh, man. If, if I was concerned with uh, graduating from high school. I'd have been doing your homework. You'd have been doing my homework and with straight manipulation. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, I think that that's a, a huge part of a lot of relationships and that people don't realize. And it can go so far, you know, that both sides of it get lost. Um, Can I bunny trail again? So yeah. you just said something that if that if this statement didn't make sense to any of the listeners, I feel like it it deserves some explanation. So you just said if I was concerned with graduating from high school, so that's a whole nother podcast. But just to address um, our own life experience and a lot of our successful friends, you know, people in the seven figures. Um, We learned early on, and it was something that was a battle for a while because I was raised that education truly is the foundation, like a formal, you know, American education, kindergarten through college, 
um, ironically, you know, the, that's the theme of my book is what is going to set you up for success. And if you don't succeed in getting a diploma, you're not going to succeed in life. And John started challenging that in me in about 11th or 12th grade of high school because I was already planning out college. And it wasn't that he was saying, don't go to college, but he was saying, do you really know what you want to spend all this time and money doing? And have you, do you have any plans to put your, get your feet wet in that arena before you just dedicate all this time and money of your life? And he, long story short, I did four years of college. I'm still one credit short of associate's degree. I feel it was all on purpose um, of God's plan of me having this full understanding and getting my, my energy to succeed from somewhere else. But at the core, we believe that school is the public school system, especially, is truly set up um, as a function of society to train kids to be nine to five workers, not so much to make you think outside of the box and to become entrepreneurs and, and creators. So that's our our bias. I, I think it, this is perfect, uh, not even as a bunny trail, but speaking specifically to this. I was challenging you because in the 11th grade, we got married Mm -hmm. and then these all became now my bills and my concerns. Yeah. So for me, it was a huge challenge. I'm like, uh, how much debt are you going to put us in (laughs) over college? Because, because you have this core belief that college is what's going to make our life great. Yeah, that, so, that it's the college degree is what's going to give our life value. So with that, uh, don't be afraid to step into the role. Um, you know, it, people will call it the father figure role because that's the role I had to step into and say, hey, uh, you know, and it wasn't controlling. Cost? He didn't stop me. I still said, I hear you, but I'm I don't feel you yet. So I I this is so deeply ingrained in me. I got to go to college. I got to try this. I got to sit in that classroom and have a professor in front of me and, you know, take some some hard tests and go through a few semesters. And it ended up being four years in my life. Um, and I got to have the experience. And by the end, um, it's everything happens for a reason. It's amazing, you know, from my story. But I thought I was done. My the the head of the department of the degree that I was working on said, congratulations, Delise, you are all done. I was like, awesome. You know, I'm getting on a plane. I was waiting to move to Las Vegas to pursue, you know, theater and entertainment industry. I was waiting to do all of that until I had this degree in my hand. And I get to Vegas a few months past and I'm like, hey, you guys are supposed to be mailing me my degree. And they're like you didn't finish your program. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I cleared this with my counselor, uh, my, the head of the program. Like what else could I have done? First it was money to, to, yeah. First I owed 500 more dollars, yeah. which, which wasn't correct. And we figured that out. Then I call a year later and it had nothing to do with money. It was all about, I'm missing one, one credit. credit. Um, but for me, that's a part of my story. I probably will never go back for that one credit because I am no longer placing the value of my life and the um, expectation of this level of success that I want to reach on this piece of paper because I'm not looking to work for someone else that's requiring it. Right. So it's not even necessary for me. Right. But so all of that because <laughs> you said if I was concerned with graduating high school and I'm like, oh, we have to explain. That. Right. right. <laughs> well, and, and I definitely want to explain. We're not anti school. Um, we we're definitely pro school, pro learning, um, pro even higher education. Um, but we definitely believe mentors over mistakes and that you shouldn't go to college if you don't know what you're going for specifically. Very, very specific. Um, because otherwise, pretty much now I'm, I'm going to tie this in as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Pretty much society is bullying you mm-hmm. into believing, believing you need this. Yeah. To, in order to be successful, to, to live the life you want to live. And if for most cases, 
And, and all right. Or to feel good about yourself. <laughs> you know, I don't want to say most I'm uh, for a lot of cases. Too. It's just not true. You yeah. know, I know so many people with college degrees that are um, not using that, it. that don't use the degree at all. One of so, our friends um, who's, you know, a millionaire, we asked him because he's working in the family business and since taking over his parents have kind of, you know, uh, sat back into retirement. They come in and help every now and then. And um, I'm excited because we have a lot of friends that fit that description. That's a good thing because yes. birds of a feather flock together. So we know where we're headed. But um, we asked him, did you go to school? And he's like, yeah, I graduated college, went back, to, you know, um, I'm sorry, I graduated high school. Then I went back, did full college, you know, got my and it was a high degree. And I'm like, but you're here, you know, running, running the shop. He's like, yeah, I thought I needed the degree. Didn't need it. Just put some debt in my pocket. And he I mean, he's he's living it up like legit, legit. <laughs> he he is not lacking for anything. Very financially successful. The nice cars, the nice children boats set and up houses. on a generational and, level of wealth. Yeah, yeah. But so yeah, that's <laughs> so we have to be careful. Uh, you know, this is a very touchy subject. This can turn so many people off, especially um, in the black culture. <laughs> yes, because of the history in this country, it's been really indoctrinated into us that. This was the white man's thing. We weren't allowed to read. They were allowed to be educated yeah. so they could be smart enough to defend themselves, to know their rights, to even biblically to know scripture and memorize the whole Bible versus taking pieces out that are going to keep you a slave. Right, right. Right. So that gets passed down through the generations and it's continued to be taught that if you don't do this, you ain't nothing. Right. <laughs> you need right. this piece of paper <laughs> to be something. I want you to do something with your life. And the do something, quote unquote, something was always wrapped into this this title that you're putting on your name. So um, if you're going to college and this is just little old me uh, speaking to the world, if you're going to college you need to intern whatever you're going to college for. You need to be in that industry in some shape or form um, before you sign the paper to go. Don't be working at freaking Walmart uh, and, and going to college to be a nurse. Right. You should be mopping up blood. Well, I can't work in the hospital um, because I'm, you know, I have I'm not even an LPN yet. Nope. You could be a janitor and mop up blood yeah. and make sure that blood isn't going to freak you out after you spent five years and five hundred thousand dollars. But um, it the, happens constantly. It makes me think of some of the professors that I had and some of the instructors that I had in college who were bullies. Yeah. <laughs> since You know, since staying on the topic of bullies uh, growing up. As a believer, college, if you're not going to a, a Christian college or some type of believing college, oh my goodness, they work really hard to break away at that foundation, whether you're in a class where they're trying to denounce creationism, um, if psychology and philosophy really heavily wants oh, to man. pick away at, at the Bible. And so, yeah, I had a lot of bullies there too. And I was just looking, you know, let me just get through this class and pass the test. But certain things you as a believer, are like, no, I can't just sit here and not say something, or I can't write the paper in a way that I feel is dishonoring my faith right, or my, right. my God, you know? Um, so that was another form of bully. Um, something else I highlighted here. If you are feeling bullied, the best way to handle a bully is to stop giving them the reactions and responses that fuel their addiction for conflict. Hmm. So sitting in a college class talking about the professor, and this can also be a picture of your relationship. If the professor has already sniffed you out as a believer or a Christian because you've done something or said something to expose yourself, um, which is great because we're supposed to be bold, right? Um, man, I've had it happen so many times. And I'm picturing, you know, the huge lecture halls. <laughs> And you get snipped out of a hundred students. You know how many people are sitting in them lecture halls. Um, and they'll say something divisive just to picket your faith and 
your values to see if you're going to debate with them in class so that they can try and embarrass you in front of the whole class or make themselves feel better about the way they believe and feel. And a lot of them, it's it's funny when you have the maturity to recognize it. They're angry at God. You know, it's not like this um, uh, neutral position of I'm a professor just trying to help you better yourself and and harden your stance to be more prepared for the world. You know, it's a lot of times, most times it's not that they're, they're really trying to use you as their punching bag because of their own uh, beliefs and anger uh, for, for whatever they've gone through in their life. But anyway, if you are feeling bullied, the best way to handle a bully is to stop giving them the reactions and responses that fuel their addiction for conflict. I wrote that sentence um, from the, pit of my soul because that was such a huge light bulb moment for me in my marriage when I realized how much control I have in our marriage over the way our arguments or conversations or or actions and scenarios play out because I don't have to say anything. If I can feel that it's heated or that you're being emotional or that I'm emotional, I can take as long as I need to think and gather myself before I give you your response. And taking that time will also allow you to have more control over not reacting. You know, um, a reaction is an immature, emotional thing that you probably would regret, whereas a response is calculated, thought out, and you're operating in wisdom, something that's going to pour Water on the fire, not gasoline. Yep. So uh, one of the things, you know, very commonly said is uh, marriage is chess, not checkers. Hmm. You have to really, really take your time. You just can't be jumping all over the board and king me at the end. King me! (laughs) (laughs) No, you have have to really take your time. Yes. Um, You know, when... When we both started playing chess, man, life yeah. got so smooth. It got so much simpler. You because... got sexy again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, man. You know, I, it really helps to understand uh, that if you take your time and you take control of your reactions or your responses, um, and you take responsibility of your responses or your reaction, um, then you definitely, you can play the game a lot better. Yes. Speaking of playing the game, if you guys have the book, this is on page 166. This is so good. I have to read this. Work on changing your victim feelings into warrior feelings. I am tired of being treated like that, but I will learn how to get my point across effectively and I will not take my spouse's need for more training personally. Man, I remember sitting at the island in the kitchen typing that and getting chill bumps because as I was typing, it was like the words. I mean, the whole book, that was the experience where there were certain points where I'm like, Man, that was good. Where did that come from? (laughs) Do not take your spouse's need for more training personally. So the book, you know, we start in preschool, we end in college because it's about training. It's about the education that matters to truly live your best life and really have a marriage that is everything you hoped it would be and more. And that only comes through education, real life education. We're not talking about academia. Um, So if you stop getting emotional when your spouse is only acting out of their lack of knowledge and recognize, oh, they're just in fourth grade in that level. You know, he just snapped at me or he just said something that hurt my feelings. Does he really want to see me cry or see me freak out or or see me sleep in another room or ask him to sleep on the couch? Is that really the result that he wants? Or is he just a fourth grader with not enough understanding as to what reaction he's asking for? Let me not give him what he's asking for when he's acting out of or she. I'm not picking on the fellas. (laughs) (laughs) Let me not give them what they're asking for, per se, but give them what they really need, which is a teacher. And we both play the teacher and we both play the student. 
Sometimes it's in balance. Sometimes we're both being teachers. We're both being students. But what you said earlier really uh, hits hits it home um, that the wisdom is in man. How did you put it? You were saying something to the effect of uh, when you slow down and you oh you play chess <laughs> you yeah. play chess not checkers right and playing chess you recognize who's being the student in that moment you recognize when you're being the student yeah and you flip it maybe if you're being an immature student that deserves the attention you know maybe you'll look at it like you know what i need a little extra more homework can we have a sit down and you give me some homework give me more understanding give me a lecture put a time limit on your lectures i i remember uh man this had to be 10 years ago and you said to me you know what you know what i john i figured it out if I'm just quiet and I don't react to what you're saying and what you're doing. You argue with yourself. You argue with yourself. <laughs> yes. I wrote that in the book too. <laughs> yes. And and I was like, what? Oh, man, hold on. Hold so- on. Here it is. Here it is. When a bully is ignored, they often find themselves having to deal with themselves, many times literally finding themselves in contention with themselves because the victim is no longer available. A bully needs an injured party in order to continue harassment like a parasite to a host. If the host isn't available, the parasitic nature will have to work itself out in other ways besides being the blood sucking burden in the life of their spouse. (laughs) I wasn't mad. I, I ain't go mad. that deep. I wasn't mad when I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> a little bitterness, you know what I mean? Uh, you know what, though? That, that's powerful because so often you find people switch the roles. They've been bullied so much um, that they become the bully. They mm-hmm. become the aggressor. And that's not what you want. Yeah. You know, you want to definitely become strong. Yeah, I was just going to say that. You definitely want to thicken your skin. For sure. If you're the crier where you're crying on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, there's something that needs to change in you. <laughs> and and to that, uh, no victim, no bully. I'm, I'm reading this out of the book. No victim, no bully. No matter how tired or wounded you feel, the victim energy you radiate only attracts more bully behavior. That's it. So... You know, my perfect example is, you know, the lion, Um, you know, not the cowardly lion from some movie. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> um, but the lion. He doesn't know pop culture, y'all. He's like from some movie. He doesn't even know what movie. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, my yeah. baby was hood. He was gangbanging <laughs> and selling drugs. He don't know nothing about the Wizard of Oz. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so just, you know, you, you want to become a lion and a lion is very, uh, a very tactical or tactful animal. Mm. Um, and they, you know, they're known as the, the baddest in the jungle because of that, not because they're just out tearing everything up and killing everyone is because they're very patient and they definitely, they, they don't expand too much energy. They really don't even chase nothing that they don't expect to kill, mm-hmm. to, you know, expect to eat. Mm-hmm. So in a relationship, you know, that's, that's the same as choosing your battles. Yes. You know, in every relationship, a lot of times you don't have to respond or react at all. Yes. Let the other person argue with himself. Yes. And, and a lot of times they'll turn the full circle. Yeah. They'll, they'll answer argue them with themselves, themselves. Answer the song, and then come back and apologize to and you. Then apologize. I've they done realized it. they were starting. I'm going to say I'm the only one in this relationship. <laughs> when I realized how much power I had, listen to me, you guys. When I realized how much power I had in my silence, man, I felt like Al Pacino. <laughs> In Godfather. <laughs> Is that correct? I know you like that movie. Oh, Is that man. the right I'm answer? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I literally like sit back with a smirk on my face and cross my arms, fold my arms, 
and watch him go through the whole cycle by his self. I did not need to jump on his emotional roller coaster and allow him to suck me in to whatever fight he wanted to have. And he would have the full cycle with himself and then apologize to me at the end. And I'm like, wow, this took me 15 years to realize Half of these arguments he could have had by his damn self. <laughs> so what you saying is <laughs> the queen is at the top of the table. Yes. On, on the chess table, huh? Yes, Godfather. This is what we're saying. <laughs> if I sit back and I'm quiet, you figure it all out yourself and, and then you come back and apologize to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I remember it. I remember, uh, watching it happen. Like I was in an outer body experience. Like, wait, uh, she's not even talking to you. What are you, why are you still yelling? Who are you yelling at now? You're stupid. You're yelling at yourself. Just shut up and apologize. And I'm like, damn it. And it takes some time, you know, where the, you catch yourself right away, like, hey, yeah, uh, don't worry about it. I'm sorry. I'll think about it later. Mm-hmm. But and then you get better because the next time you start an argument with yourself, you're aware of it at the beginning, and so it's a lot shorter, and they get shorter and shorter and shorter. But for that to work out, the other person has to be holding their own. They have to be walking yes. as the teacher and allowing the lesson to be taught. And that doesn't always mean you have to be. Uh, interacting with the person or jumping on their emotional bandwagon. And, and I'm not, so this can go, you know, so many ways. Cold shoulder. I, I'm not okay with cold shoulder. Yeah. I, I'm no. not okay. I don't think that's uh, good for any relationship. I think quiet, you know, at specific times is, is really good. And then I, I don't, want anyone to turn into a bully because or turn into the aggressor Mm -hmm. you know because you've gotten so strong that a flip just switches one day and they're like you know what i'm done with this and now you're the bully and we're back at point eight yeah 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 because roles reverse all the time all the time that is not what you're looking for yeah you got to come to the balance so i had to stop crying and being emotional and allowing my feelings to be hurt and and i had to like level up with myself and say where does he want this to end up i know he doesn't want to end up where i'm like you sleep on the couch tonight that will frustrate him even more so what is he trying to say what is he trying to get off his chest is this one of those moments where I need to let him have an argument with himself or does he earned my conversation? Has he earned? So yeah. listen, if he's yelling at me, if he's throwing knives, you know, verbal knives, he hasn't earned a, a call and response, a, uh, you know, a pass the ball back and forth interaction. Right. Because he's not talking to me the way I want my student or my teacher to teach me. I don't learn like this. And right. this isn't the classroom environment that I want. So I'm going to be quiet until this environment comes to the level that I'm at. Because I'm playing chess while you're over here yelling, playing checkers. Right. When you come to my level in this moment, then we can talk. For and sure. then our marriage just started. Man, we catapulted. We skipped a few grades, right? Yes. Once you understand a concept, you can test out of a grade. And I talk about that in the book. Not every marriage has gone through the same pains, trials, and tribulations as the next marriage because of the information and understanding and morals and values that they already had, or maybe a lesson that they had already learned earlier on. So they can test out and skip skip some drama. This is from page 167. The defeated teacher looking for a new career is the spouse who has decided that life will be better after divorce before they have given their all toward being the best teacher and student of marriage that they could possibly be. Man, when you say give their all, Mm -hmm. uh, so many people, you know, we're, we're believers. So giving your all is so deep, man, is so deep because even after you thought that you gave everything that you had, 
you know, then you, you take some time, you pray, you ask God to give you some more and give that, um, before you ever just decide to quit. Mm -hmm. Um, we used to have a saying, uh, you can, you can be fired and not know it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you could be in a relationship and you've already fired your spouse. Mm -hmm. You've already moved on in your head. You know, you're You're existing together, (laughs) but you've already moved on. You're not even in the marriage anymore. Yeah. You checked out. you're picking out the new furniture in this apartment that you haven't moved into yet, you know? Yeah. And I likening that into a classroom because I've worked in so many classroom settings, both with juvenile uh, uh, delinquents and in, in male juvenile detention facility and also in the inner city schools. The person that is checked out is the one where the teachers at the front of the class teaching a lesson and 20 of the students are doing the work and working the problems and raising their hand and interacting. And there's this one kid in the back who's coloring. Mm -hmm. They're not in class at all. (laughs) They're sitting there, but they're not involved in the relationship. And some people would say, well, I'm unequally yoked, you know, or I finished all of my work. And you have to figure out the balance uh, in a relationship, becoming student teacher. Yes. You know, back and forth, student, teacher, student, teacher, and not, well, I finished all my work. So now I'm going to pick on the other person. Right. And become the bully. Um, and then know. the teacher having the correct response. The student with learning disabilities is not the shortfall of the classroom, but rather the teacher who doesn't learn to adapt to the needs of the student and the lesson that the experience aims to teach. Right. So. A really good teacher will notice the one in the corner with the coloring book and be able to um, attentively draw them back in or give them what they need to get them closer to the level they need to be to while still, you know, moving forward with the program. For sure. So in a relationship, you have to pay attention. You have to, you know, figure out the likes, what your wife likes, what, you know, what your husband likes. And and then you have to, you know, make the adjustments. You know, I have one thing uh, and I I always have. I always try and make my wife laugh. Always from from the beginning of our relationship, whether it be corny or not. Um, it works most of the time. <laughs> it, it just, <laughs> you know, it, it's just something to to keep the mood light. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think laughter is very healing. Yeah. And. You know, if I can make you laugh in a tense situation or, you know, in a heavy situation, um, for me, that helps, you know, that's me being the teacher, like, hey, we're going to pull through this. It's, it's okay. Whatever it may be. Um, and you know, not in an argument, like, oh, let me try and tickle her to make her laugh, but there's so much other stuff that happens in a marriage besides, an argument, not down drag out, you know, just paying bills, Mm -hmm. just going to work, Mm -hmm. you know, shoot, just waking up in the morning. If, if you can make someone smile or laugh inside of those things, you step out of the, the bully, um, you know, you step into the, the friend. Yes. Oh, I'm so happy you said that you step out of the bully role or the parenting role to your spouse and you step back into the friend role, which is the role everything began in. And that's why you married each other in the first place. Yes. Um, many times the school bully is also the student with learning or social disabilities. So as a friend, you're no longer getting frustrated with the social or learning disabilities of your spouse in the relationship, but you are now, a friend who is able to coach them through it and creatively think of the lesson plan they need to get them to the level, not that you want them to get to, but shoot, they want to get there. Yeah, They want to be better and improve and grow (laughs) because they want, everyone really wants life to be good. And laugh Mm -hmm. in, in, you know, on your way through those things, laugh at it, have fun, smile, you know, just really take your time. If you are the bully, You know, really take your time and figure out how you can better uh, understand your spouse. Yeah. Um, And if you're being bullied, definitely, you know, woman, man, whatever, you know, 
<laughs> grow some cojones <laughs> and uh, just really figure out what it's going to take not to uh, feed the bullying, not to respond, mm-hmm. figure out, you know, how to play the game. Yeah. Let them have the war within themselves because that that really is what it is. If someone's bullying in the relationship and trying to be controlling and just always nagging you and then, and then, you know, it's always something really the problem there is they're at war with themselves, but they can't be made privy to that fact because you're always there mm-hmm. to give them the fight they're looking for with themselves. So you're standing in the way by responding to the things that you know and they know they're doing to push your buttons. But because you're allowing your button to be pushed by giving them the response they're looking for right? The or the reaction that they're looking for, you're not allowing that war that needs to happen with them happen. So 20, 30 years of marriage, you're still dealing with these things that actually bother you and you've made them aware that it bothers you but they haven't stopped because you haven't changed you you right. can't change them right yeah and so go ahead i wanted to say this set boundaries and be patient and creative in finding new and different ways to teach the lessons your student needs to learn withholding affection and sex to teach your spouse a lesson is a short-lived resolution like a band-aid for a gunshot wound <laughs> It's funny that that's actually along the lines of what I was going to say. So if you are the bully, bullying is always short lived, whether if if you bullied uh, the smart kid to do your homework and that made it all the way through high school, what are you going to do once you get to college? Mm hmm. Are you going to find someone else to try and bully? That's awesome. What if you make it all the way through college? What about when you get the job? What about when you get the job of the degree that you didn't work towards? Hmm. You're going to learn really quick that you didn't know, that you didn't do the hard work to to what it takes you there. So That makes me think of uh, theory versus practical application. School is all theory, and then you get out in the real world. And you're like, wait, <laughs> I didn't understand any of this. Actually, I didn't do any of this because. Or, am I going to use calculus now? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, but you really take your time, uh, figure out in what areas you're being bullied and what areas you're the bully. Because it's in almost every relationship and figure out how to play the game. Yes. And uh, I got to say this because we're talking smack about about school. Um, It's really important to learn who you are if you're the one still looking toward college um, or if you are a parent with children. Man, the book that I always go back to is Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because that was the eye opener for us. It had confirmed some things, so many things that was already in our spirit. Um, But find whatever your book is that's going to speak to you. Do some research on discovering and understanding and how to see your child for who God made them to be, because we are all born with a gifting. We are all geniuses. Um, I think it's the Einstein quote that says, if you judge a fish by his ability to climb a tree, he will be considered dumb. Yeah. And so for the majority of us, we come out of the uh, regular school system and we feel less than or we feel dumb because we're fish, you know, being graded on how well we can climb trees. So I want to speak to that. If you've got a little doctor or a lawyer, then, man, school it up. Get get in them books. Um We can close. I want to say uh, this last part. For many years, my strategy for dealing with bullying was to retaliate and withdraw. Vengeance added to the negative force that ruled our classroom of matrimony and delayed us from reaching our aspirations. Wow. That's in the book? That's in the book. (laughs) (laughs) This book, I'm so proud of this book. This book is good. I step away from it for a while. And then I pick it up and just start reading. I'm like, dang, man, well, people need to get this book. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say, I want to say I'm I'm super proud of you. 
uh, taking the time, sitting down and, and writing, uh, the growing into a mature marriage and, you know, having to relive a lot of our life, uh, that wasn't necessarily good. Uh, but in order to try and help other marriages, other relationships, uh, make it through it. Um, I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for it. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, to graduate. Uh, whatever grade we're in, whatever grade we're in. <laughs> our kids, whenever we are, um, having <laughs> our fun little spats or talking smack to each other, um, our son and, and daughter in law say, College, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, that's They're where you guys are, huh? College, smart huh? behinds. So, so yeah, God bless you guys. We love you guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We, Pray that this is helping the masses. I'm speaking that into existence. If you know anyone that could benefit from this conversation or the book, please point them to our podcast. We are up on all of the major uh, podcast platforms. We just got a notification that we are now on iHeartRadio. That one took like yeah. a month to get approval. So we're just really excited of the expanse um, that we've been allowed to to have a hold of and all the people that we're going to be able to touch because marriage, whoo, marriage can be a difficult one and we want to make it easier for you. Um, the website is deleasecollins.com. You can find the book there. I have blogs posted there. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, search Delise Collins. Leave us a review on on the podcast. Uh, that definitely helps. Yes. Um, subscribe. Five stars and a comment. Subscribe to the podcast. If you don't like it, you can give us one star. We don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, five stars, five stars. <laughs> um, but thank you, guys. Uh, my wife normally reads the remember. The mature marriage was once an immature, sloppy, hot mess. We We all all have have to to start start somewhere. somewhere. Love yourself so that you can love each other. We love you and we'll talk to you guys again soon. I am your announcer, Jason Head. This has been a Clear Cut Concepts production in association with the published work Growing Into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College. Available on Amazon.com, Target.com, eBay, and the Denver famous Tattered Cover Bookstore. Rejection doesn't hurt, expectation does. Lying doesn't kill, denial does. Forgetting doesn't heal, forgiveness does. Mr. Farang.